Introducing our host, Fred Swanica, in conversation with iconic global leaders. Welcome to The Pathway. Greetings. Thank you for joining us today for the season one finale of The Pathway. As you know, we launched this conversation series a few months ago to learn about the unconventional pathways that great leaders take to achieve impact in the world. Look around your desk. If not now, then at least sometime in the last 15 years, you've owned a mouse, a pair of computer speakers, a keyboard, a USB device, or even a webcam. Now, these are very small devices that you might take for granted and that you might not even notice. But just think for a moment. Would you have been able to fully enjoy Dell, HP, or Sony PC without these small accessories? Our guest today passionately believes in the power of being small. And we'll hear in a moment why. Please join me in welcoming one of the more genuine people I've had the pleasure of meeting in recent times, Bracken Darrell the president and CEO of Logitech. Bracken has an MBA from Harvard and is known for guiding the growth and reinvention of iconic brands such as Old Spice, Gillette, Brown, and Whirlpool. And since he took the helm of Logitech eight years ago, he's trained it with his unconventional exceptional leadership from a $1 billion company into the $19 billion small company it is today. Bracken, welcome to The Pathway. Fred, thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. And I, I have to say I'm a little humbled by this. I should be interviewing you. Interviewing you. <laughs> no, thank you so much again for joining us. Um, you know, Bracken, I was really impressed that Logitech sales increased by 76% during the pandemic and you know, during this global recession that we're all in. And uh, you were recently ranked among the top three CEOs in Switzerland by Obermatt for this feat. So, it's a real privilege, privilege to have you share some of your wisdom with us today. Well, thank you. For, I really now, appreciate Now, let's start. That. Thank you again for being here. Bracken, popular culture and business constantly pushing, pushes us to get in, right? Most companies strive to do things faster and to scale as much as possible. Now, just now when I introduced you, you believe in the power of remaining small, at least in mentality. Let's watch a, a short clip of you talking about this. My first principle is be small. Don't ever let yourself think you're any bigger than you are. You're not. You're really small. You're tiny. You're this little thing on this planet Earth. So you, you don't ever think you're big. You're small, you're tiny. You're this little thing on planet Earth. Can you tell us a bit more about, you know, why it's important to stay small? I think, I, I think the real message inside the, the rest of that line is that um you know just to be humble you know it's it's uh it's very easy in different times in your life when you have a little bit of what other people would call success to suddenly get too full of yourself and and uh you know humility is such a powerful thing maybe the most valuable thing about humility is that you uh, you realize that you have so much to learn all the time no matter what you're in you know, every day in this job and i've been in it nine years now it just blows my mind how much more I'm learning. And, uh, and, you know, I think we should all be seeking that. So I think, you know, just making sure you keep yourself, your feet on the ground about who you are is really critical. So what are some of the that you've used to keep your, your feet on the ground, as you just put it? You know, you've grown from a billion dollar business to a $19 billion business in just eight years. I mean, that's for growth, that you're no longer small. You know, you keep talking about wanting to be small and, and, and staying humble. What are some of the tactics that you personally use, Bracken? Well, I, I, I take small in every direction, you know. So, so the most effective team uh, for most of my life that I used to look to and think, okay, that's the time when it really worked well was when I was growing up at my, my mom's house. You know, she was a single mother. We had, I had three siblings. We didn't have very much money. And we did our homework in our, you know, and we talked at our kitchen table. You know, we didn't, so we sat around the kitchen table. We didn't have a dining room table. We sat around the kitchen table and we, I did my homework next to my sister who was studying something and needed help next to my brother who was studying something I didn't know yet. 
and then my other brother and my mom was usually there either doing something on the table so i learned so much in that that small group and as i got older and i started uh working for large companies and things i i, I just kept noticing the bigger the group the worse the experience and um uh, and i began i just developed a philosophy that you know small is is really beautiful you know and, and almost everything you know and so finding ways to work in small teams so that's one thing the second thing that i've uh i've always been a believer in a believer in is in terms of right, really trying to keep yourself your own ego small um one of the best ways to do it is to do what i used to tell my mom uh when i was growing up when she got divorced uh you know she was really she had a really tough time and i became her kind of uh home 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 psychologist you know or at least i listened well and she would say to me I'll come back and and tell me all the things she thought she'd done wrong in that day you know oh, i wish i hadn't done this i probably shouldn't have done that what do and i of course i was think i was 13 or 14 years old and i knew i wasn't going to be great at any any advice about specifically what she should do but but i used to say hey mom you know you got a stick in your hand you're standing on the beach draw that line behind your feet you know, behind your heels and everything behind you is done you know all you can do is learn from it so don't regret it don't don't don't, don't over celebrate it you know just learn from it and your whole life is right from here forward in front of that line and so if you could really get to that way and i try to get to that way as much as i can uh, every day it keeps you humble mm -hmm. so you're saying forget how big you that's in your past look at what's still ahead of you don't dwell on all the success you've had just really you know, focus uh, on, on, on the small things you can do today to move forward and, 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 and don't get caught up in your own hype. That's really, that's really, um, you know, very yeah, likely. Yeah, I, so, I would go even further, Fred. I, I'd go even further on that. I think, you know, and I, I'm kind of jumping ahead on some of the things you might want to ask, but I, there are two words that I think uh, would be very helpful to take out of your vocabulary today. Um, I've tried to take them out of mine and they keep creeping back in. One of them is, uh, is success. <laughs> Success is a very, very uh, slippery slope. I mean, once you think you've got some success, you want to protect it. And once you start protecting it, you stop taking the same kind of risks that you took to, to be, in quotation marks, successful. And so suddenly your, your success, and Fred, you've probably experienced this over and over again because you're very successful. You know, you suddenly become, uh, you become the, the image that you think you've created and you try to be that image instead of being the creator that, that got you there. And so I think you just did success, forget it. It's a terrible idea. Whoever came up with the idea that success was good was completely wrong. You should be eliminating the idea of success. The other one you should eliminate is failure. You know, it's almost as bad as the idea of success. So failure, failure is like getting a grade in school. You get a bad grade and, and you're supposed to feel bad about it. Um, but, and, and so if you have a really bad grade, you failed. But the problem with failure is that actually the only way we, about 95% of the way we learn as we grow up is by trying things that don't work. We pick up a glass, we drop it. We pick up a glass again, we drop it again. We trip, we fall, we stand up, we trip. And that's the way life is. And, and so you need to risk manage your glass drops and risk manage your, your trips, but you need to have them and you need to not be afraid of them. In fact, you need to jump right into things that aren't like, in some cases aren't likely to work. So that you keep learning. So failure is a terrible idea. Just and and success is a terrible idea. Just throw them out. Just replace both words with learning. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, one of the things that I do to try and remain humble is I never watch media about myself. I never watch it. I don't. I try not to read anything, any interview, or any yeah. because then you just leave your 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 own media and your own. <laughs> and I completely agree with you as well that you know uh, failure is absolutely the best way to learn. So yes, we should embrace it. We need to, in fact, like you say, banish it from our vocabulary because everything then becomes just a learning opportunity. Uh, so Bracken, you know, we know that reinvention played a significant role in finishing its second year in history and turning it into its second year in history uh, and turning it into a billion dollar multinational that it is today. So what's the single most important step you took to reinvent Logitech over the last eight years? You know, it's it, it's always hard to get something down to one most important thing. I think if I had to, um, but if you force me to, I would say it was it was de deciding we were going to become a design company, and um, 
you know, most people wouldn't look at us and call us a design company today, but I did way back then, even though we didn't have any designers and we didn't have any design principles and we did use design companies on the outside some, but, uh, and the reason that was the most important one is because it, it, this is true for everybody on this, everybody who's listening here, you know, understanding the customer and getting close to customers, no matter what your business or nonprofit or education, whatever, no matter what you're doing, being really close to the customer and trying to understand them to the point where you can understand what they need or what they want, even better in some cases than they do. And they might unconsciously need something if they don't realize it. Getting to that point is what amazing design is all about. And you can never stop learning when you're in a design company. You never stop. You never finish design. You're never done. I think um, as much as the uh, the iPhone is such a remarkable product, it's it's a terrible piece of advertising for the design function or the design experience because it's too good. It's too beautiful. It's too perfect. You know, great design is not perfect. Great design is a, is a step along towards towards a better way. And uh, and so I would say bringing design was the most important thing I did because it made us make our products more powerful, more innovative, and more successful. Mm-hmm. So you're saying you never stop, you know, it's always work in progress, right? So true design companies, you're constantly reinventing and, 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 and iterating and improving. And you're trying to put that customer at the center of everything that you're doing. Now, um, does design, is it about just products? Or, I mean, how do you, you know, is it about products? Is it about experiences? What does it mean to really be a design company? Okay. I'm so glad you asked me this because I've been, I've, so I think a design, I don't know a design company today. Okay. There might be one out there somewhere. Could be the IDO, Tim Brown's IDO, who, uh, who I know very well and respect. Maybe they are. And it might also be that Apple is. I don't, you know, it's hard to know Apple because they're very, um, they're very strong and, and secretive in a good way. Um, but I don't know any, I've never experienced one. But here's what a great design company would be. It would be a company that did what you would expect a design company to be, bring amazing experience and products to its customers um, on, a, on a regular basis and, and across its portfolio and keep upgrading the experience regularly. But, but, the, but the, the interesting thing that I think very few companies do, so there's kind of, um, so here's, here, let, me, let me break it down in a different way for a second. There, I think there are three stages of design companies. Number one, most companies decorate products at the end. They create something and then they say, ooh, this needs to look good. And they decorate it. The second stage design companies, they actually build the product. If they're really good, they build the product around the user. So they figure out what's the user need? What do I need right now from this camera that I'm on and from the microphone that's in front of me? What do I need? And then how can I build those products around me for what I need, what the direction I'm speaking, how I'm comfortable sitting? So that's a it's really good design companies. Apple does this well, very well. We do it pretty well. You know, I think more and more companies are doing this better and better. And you can keep doing this forever in a better and better way. That's what I was talking about earlier. A stage three design company, a third level design is the one I don't know of anybody doing, which is they then take design and they turn it inside and they, they treat every internal customer, including uh, let's say in every process as if it could be a design process, a design experience for the user inside. So for example, a, a, um, when you, uh, an employee starts in, at, at, in our company and they need equipment before the day that they start, that experience can be designed around them so that when they come, not only do they have their equipment, but it's, it's surprisingly fun or it's surprisingly meaningful. The way they got the equipment might tell them something about the culture. So you can do that across every single function. And I think I've got a stage four design company, which I've never talked about before oh, anywhere. Wow. Tell us okay, about that. Get ready. Get ready. This is this is hot. <laughs> right? off the press. First time ever <laughs> on pathway. <laughs> First time ever in public. A stage four design company, which we are not, and I don't think any company is either, would not only be amazing experience for users, and not only be amazing experience for all the people who work there, but it would be amazing experience for for and, and a brand building experience for every single touch that comes with the company. So for example, if, you, if you're a supplier and you came to work with us, you would improve. In our case, we're, we're trying to help uh, people create, achieve and enjoy life more, to realize their passions, to fulfill their passions. Though a, a supplier would, help, would actually fulfill, help fulfill their passions by interacting with us. Even a supplier that didn't get the job 
might get a personal note from me that said, here's why you didn't get the job, you know, and here's, here's what you could have done better. And, and I really want you to be successful in the future. Even if you end up at a competitor, you know, I want you to be successful. Here's a website. We're going to keep updating for personal growth for people who didn't get in here or suppliers who didn't win the bid because we want you to create, achieve, and enjoy life more. We can do it for suppliers. You can do it for uh, people who interviewed with us who didn't make it, for everybody. For even for the person who walks in our front door, just for one visit with one person in one office, there, there should be a way that I come in and, and just from that momentary interaction, I, it improves my life somehow. To, it, it helps me pursue my passions. And I could, get, I could go deeper on that, but that's, I think that's stage four mm. design company. I get it. I get it. So stage four design company would not only continuously improve itself, but it would even be improving its ecosystem, right? So employees, suppliers, anyone that's interacting with are constantly because of their interactions with that company. You know, um, last year here in the room, we reorganized ourselves and uh, we created a model similar to what Spotify uses, where we have tribes and squads. And when we did that, one of the the things that I personally mandated was that every single squad should have three superpowers. One is a technology superpower to learn how we, get, we can automate things and continue to get better. Number two is a data superpower, so we can constantly use data to uh, improve. And then number three was a design. So I mandated that every single team, like you said, the people team, the finance team should have a designer. We still haven't gotten there yet, but that's the vision. So. It looks like we're on our track right. to becoming a, a stage three design company if, if we can make it up. Um, so I hope my team is listening. You know. Fred, you'll probably Sorry? get there before we will. I wouldn't be, you'll probably get there before we will. We're trying. Well, but, uh, we'll I'll try. We're up. small. So hopefully, we, hopefully, hopefully, as a small company, we can do that. Now, you segment your business uh, into, into three buckets. Trees, plants. Can you explain what each of these mean? Yeah. So, so when I first came to Logitech, I, there, we had a portfolio, you know, we had eight, eight, basically eight categories and we had the, 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 the core business, which was the mouse and keyboard business. And it was kind of old and, and it was, it was at the time it was declining, not, not rapidly, but declining. And, uh, it was, it was profitable. So that was, I thought, well, that's kind of like a big old tree. You just want to protect in the backyard. You know, the one, the one you don't want to fall down, but you, it's not going to give you a lot of new stuff. And then we immediately entered some new businesses that were fast growing. They were exciting. They were maybe not as profitable, but they could be. And so those were plants, fast growing plants. And then there was, then I started, we started working on seeds, which were secret projects. They were underground, literally uh, and figuratively. And they were, they were new like startups. And I, we actually started staffing them with entrepreneurs or former entrepreneurs or people in the company kind of wanted to be. And then we separated them from everything else because, man, it's hard for a seed to grow if it's got to fight for the, for the, the, the water and, and nutrients with the big trees of the plants. So we separated them completely. Often they reported to me. And then we took care of them, you know, and I, and I would meet with them every two or three weeks and, and have a small team that did that. And I still do that. So trees, plants, and seeds, we still operate that way today. Okay. Okay. Now, do you think we can apply this notion of trees, plants, and seeds to our personal lives? Um, and if so, what aspect of your life today would you put in those three buckets? Well, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, uh, of lateral learning. And so what is lateral learning? You can go deep on stuff, you know, like, like if you, let's say you, uh, you love, uh, philosophy, you know, you just love philosophy. So you start reading Heidegger and you just go deeper and deeper in philosophy and then you become a philosophy expert, you know, and that's great and it's fun. And, and you know, the, everybody here is, is probably an expert or on their way to being one something. Could be the job you're in. Um, but I, and I think that's terrific. And, you know, and, and also I think we're all told, you know, make sure to, pl- to keep developing your strengths, you know, because they're the, your superpowers. You know, these are these things that are going to, you're going to use to become this, this more and more powerful person for the world and for yourself. I'm also a believer though, that, that actually we need to always be laterally learning. We need to be adding new things. And I would think of those as seeds in your uh, intellect or in your capability, finding new things to develop all the time. You know, I hate it when people say, well, you know, I'm too old to play the piano. I'm too old to learn another language. I'm too old to become an expert in art. 
I'm too old to do this. I'm not too old to do that. Or I'm not interested. You know, I hate both of them because interest is a choice. You know, sometimes it's DNA driven. You just can't help yourself. Sometimes you just say, you know what? I'm going to go learn something new. You know, so so seeds are new things you develop that are that end up being at least no, new knowledge or capabilities. I, I will argue that any new knowledge is a, is a capability that you can apply to your job. Because if you think about the way we create solutions and the way we create things in general, most of the creation we do in the world is analogy, is taking an analogy from one place and applying it to another one. You know, like um, tripping and falling. Okay, how can I take the experience of tripping and falling and apply it to um, creating the next mouse? Okay, uh, I, I, I was, you know, how would I do that? Okay, well, okay, tripping and falling has applied to the next mouse. I can start generating ideas against that right now. One of them is, you know, tripping and falling, uh, does, it, 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 it doesn't hurt that much, hurts a little bit, but the main thing is I always get back up. So tripping and falling is maybe I should have a serial way of experimenting in sprint mode against iterating very fast against new options until finally I'm not tripping and falling anymore. You see what I mean? So learning about things is a capability that you can use as an analogy for the things that you are working most of the time on. So seeds are super critical mm. to personal life, in my opinion. Mm. So you could imagine that the trees are the deep ex are the areas of deep expertise that you have, what you really That's learned and over you know decades, and then the you know the plants are the things that maybe you've recently become an expert in or something, or that you've recently come to know, and then the seeds yeah. are the things that are very far away that you're just learning. And so, in a way, you're almost applying design thinking to yourself. You're continuously improving yourself um, and and and, yeah. and uh, iterating and becoming. Uh, yeah, cool. Um, I love. Your okay, question. so Darren, you're you also. Just, you just did to me Sorry? what I was saying you should do. You you took you just did to me what I was suggesting in a beautiful way. You took the analogy of the trees, plants, and seeds that I'm using. You applied it to something different, and it's really meaningful. <laughs> I will now use that. Oh. <laughs> yeah, then, then we can talk about learning in that way. I like that. Um, so, Bracken, you're famous for firing and rehiring yourself as a free-thinking newcomer, uh, and you even give people the advice to fire themselves and go back to zero to become perpetual beginners. Uh, so what uniqueness does a newcomer bring? You know, a newcomer um, a newcomer has so many advantages. I meet with every new employee in the company in small groups usually now. but um, And I just to talk about various things. But the last thing I do is I always ask them to send me a note. It's sometime in the first 30, 60, or 90 days with, with things they would change. They can either, things we should stop, things we should start, things we should change, continue to do but change or do differently. And the reason, I, and I tell them what I'll tell that, the way I'll answer that question, I, I say, you know, you have something I've lost as a newcomer. I can never be a newcomer again. <clears throat> it, it's gone for me forever. And you have it just for a very fleeting moment. You'll have it just for a little while. And if you, if when you lose it, we can't get it back, you know? And so please write me these notes because a newcomer's advantage is the fact that I've walked into my, my uh, desk area every day and I stopped noticing what color the carpet is. And I stopped noticing what color the ceiling is. And I stopped noticing what the, I stopped noticing almost everything. But the newcomer notices everything. When a child walks into a room for the first time, they really soak it all up. When you walk into the room for the 500th time, you actually just see a sliver of the room and your brain builds the rest of the room that you already know. You've lost your ability to see the room. Well, the reason that, that, um, that firing yourself, if you've been in the same job for a while, is an interesting idea is because it's at least a, a, a tool to try to get yourself back to newcomer status. And it, and uh, I can tell that story if you want me to, but I don't need to. But I think, I think being a newcomer has real advantages. So does being an old timer. So I'm not down on old timers out there. The wisdom of experience is so valuable. I just think it, uh, we talk more about that, a lot more about that than we do about how valuable being a newcomer is. Mm -hmm. The value of, of the fresh perspective, the clean slate. So, I mean, just talk a, bit, a little bit about how you fired yourself. Like, did you literally quit and then take a few months off and come back? I mean, did you do that and, and, and what, and how did that impact your leadership? Uh, I did not do that. I'd been here about five, I'd been at Logitech about five years and the company was worth, I don't remember now, eight, eight times more than when I started. And, it, and but it, more importantly, it was just very, very different from the company I joined, you know, so it was, uh, felt like a different company. And then I, and, and so it was around Christmas and every year I'd go back and look at the goals I set for last year. I kind of score myself and I think about the goals for next year. 
And then it got me thinking, you know, am I the right person for this job for the next five years? Because it's so different from the last five. And I can't even imagine how different it'll be five years from now because things are going faster now, not slower. So I thought, you know, it's, I mean, so I thought, I thought, you know what? There's no way that, 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 that I mean, there might be no. So I said, well, what would the future person be? And I made a, a list of what attributes they'd have. And then I wrote down mine and I thought, you know, okay, I'd be in the running for the job, you know, if they were hiring again today, because uh, I've got, you know, for a lot of reasons, but I have one big problem, which is I know too much. I was involved in every strategic choice. Most of the people in the leadership positions I chose, I, I the products I touched, you know, will I have the objectivity to leave things behind, to drop things coldly and even to move people out and to move on with the right decisiveness and clarity of thought and independence? So I thought, no, there's no way I can do that. So I decided I'm going to fire myself. I'll quit. And tomorrow morning, I'll tell my chairman, I've got lots of things. I can, I'll, I'll keep working forever. So I'm not worried about finding a job. I'll find one. So I, so I went to bed that night and I said, thought I'd sleep on it like I always do on important decisions now. And as happens to me so often with important decisions that are judgment based and I sleep on them, I flipped 180 degrees. I woke up the next morning. I thought, no, I, I know exactly what I need to do. I need to sign a new contract. <laughs> I need to start a job. And it needs to be the, the job of running Logitech. And I need to leave every one of those sacred cows that I have created behind. I don't own them anymore. They're just part of the past. I inherited that from that guy who did a pretty good job before. But boy, he screwed up a lot too. And he's totally missing the boat if he doesn't do what I'm about to do. So I went in and, and felt like I didn't ever again. <laughs> so you mentally fired yourself and then you came back the next day. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Now, There's a little bit. Like, moving. Right. Sorry? There's a little more to that story if you want to hear it, but I don't need to tell it. I can come back. All right. We'll talk about Fair it another time. time. Um, so you spoke uh, to your son's school in 2016 and you admonished him and his classmates to strive for hunger. But, you know, don't most people yearn to be full? So why hunger, you know, challenge them to really strive for hunger? Well, you know, we, we, hunger is a value that we literally have in our company. You know, we, we call it out as one of our 10 values. Um, the, the reason why hunger is important is because it's so, it, it creates drive. You know, everybody, I mean, the most, most uh, you know, I, I, we've all been around people, and I hope there are some of you that have this strong internal drive. You know, this, this engine that just is unstoppable. Fred, you have it. You know, it's like, you know, you just, no matter what would happen, they could build a wall in front of you, either go through it, over it, around it, or under it. I mean, you're going, you know, there's nothing stopping Fred. I mean, it's just the way you are. And I, and, um, and, and all of us have that inside in some way. Um, and actually it's most obvious when we're, when you think about hunger, when you think about a hawk, and in that talk, I, I showed a picture of a hawk. You know, hawks actually don't, they don't fly until they're hungry. They just sit there. <laughs> I don't know what they're doing. They're probably just sitting around thinking. But, but, they're, but boy, once they get hungry enough, they become these superstar athletes. And they swoop out and they fly at incredible speeds. And they are so active and so strong. So, um, so the bottom line is they need literal hunger to get off the perch. We, we can't rely on that. You know, if you, if you have to wait until you're hungry every day to get a great, do a great job, then you're in trouble, you know, and it's also very uncomfortable. So, so the, the concept of hunger for me actually can be created and it can, and the, our drive, and it can be created by falling in love with the idea of using goals. You know, goals are the most powerful things in the world. They're also free. You know, they cost nothing. You know, it's incredible to me that such a powerful thing costs you nothing and they're available. And yet so few people use them uh, enough. So what a goal does is if you, a goals can be tricky. I mean, if you set it too high, you give up on it. If you set it too low, it's not worth having. So setting them somewhere in there in the right space is, is important, but it's not, if you're wrong, it's okay too. You'll learn. So, but, but, but setting goals creates, if you get conviction around your goal and you really decide I want it, then it becomes like hunger. It's just like your stomach it creates an empty space that you you need to fill, and you'll figure out how to fill it. Mm, mm, mm. That goal is what creates the hunger, and then it brings the drive, and then you know that's where the energy comes, and you just keep going. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. That's why we all need to have you know goals. Um, now um, you talk about being inspired by idealists such as Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela. In fact, you stated they inspire us. They move us to action and change the world because they create a picture of a future that we should 
and can achieve. So what are the actions that we should all be taking in creating a better future? You know, it's, a, it's such a big question. And, uh, you know, one of the core beliefs I have is I love people. You love people, Fred. You know, we, we are, you know, we have that so much in common. And, I, and I'm, such a, um, I'm such a believer in personal growth. And I would say that the most important thing for me, you know, it's a little hard for me to answer that for everybody else. For me, the most important thing in my life is unlocking people's power to pursue the things they really want to get done in their lives, you know, passions. And uh, the cool thing about my job, and this may seem weird to you from a, from a, a guy who works for a mouse company, is that I'm in an ideal place to be. I'm really in an ideal place to do that. I can touch, we can touch millions of people every day and help them unlock their passions. And at our very, very best, you don't even notice us. We disappear. When we're doing our, the best job we possibly can, that mouse that we spent so much time on trying to perfect and simplify and make make super capable actually feels like a part of you, like an extension of you. And you don't notice it anymore. You just click and you move and you race and you run and you scroll and, you, and it's it's you, you know? And in, the, in this call, you know, I'm on one of our cameras right now. At its very best, it's just you and me in a conversation one on one. We don't even notice that we're there's a microphone and a speaker. And a, you know, we don't notice our, our lens. We don't notice it because it's connecting us. And so, this pursuit of helping people fulfill their passions is something I feel so strongly about, and I feel lucky to be in the job that can do it. But all of you are in in roles in your life where you can do it, whether it's for a child, or a friend, or a coworker, or somebody who reports to you, or somebody you report to. Mm. Talk about, I, think, you know, I, I will just I think when, I, when you talk about uh, Nelson Mandela or Martin Luther King, you know, it's just it's almost it's I'm awed by those people because they felt that they felt that what I just described, they felt that they acted on it in such a bold, brave way. Both. You know, I always think the world moves forward in two ways, it moves forward in marginal gains those little improvements that happen every day that are 99% of the, what, the way the world moves. I mean, marginal gains are so important in a business, in a job, in your life. You know, every day, if you get one-tenth of 1% 1 better, imagine what you'll be in two years, you know. And then bold moves. And the bold moves are very, very few. I mean, in your life, you, have, you make very few really bold moves. I don't mean stupid, reckless moves. I mean really bold moves, moves you believe in, that you line yourself up on, bold moves. So marginal gains and bold moves. Well, when I look at Martin Luther King and I look at uh, Nelson Mandela, those are two guys who were, I would say their, their, their unique formula of marginal gains and bold moves is very difficult to beat. I mean, I, I don't think there are very many people in, in war. So they're very aspirational for me. Mm -hmm. Marginal goals and bold moves. I like that. Um, you know, in, earlier on, you were talking about how your products just seem to disappear when they're working well, and I just realized I'm a Logitech camera right now. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and so well, I hardly had noticed it. Um, so now talking about failure, we touched a bit about this, that you actually think, you know, um, this is really something that should be banished from people's um, vocabulary. Now, when, when someone fails at Logitech, you give them a bonus and you move them elsewhere. And how did this philosophy on giving bonuses affect us? <laughs> well, so we have, in, in the trees, plants, and seeds, we have, in the seeds, you know, we have between five and 15 new categories in development all the time. And you know, we've gone from those eight categories that we started, we started with, we now have 34 or more. And, uh, and so, and one of the ways we develop them is we've got these, you know, five to 15 at a time internal entrepreneurs creating new stuff, you know, and most of them don't work. Okay. And a lot of them don't work very quickly. A few actually go out and become successful in the marketplace. So that means there's a lot of things that didn't work. It's, some people would call those failures. So we're very slow to, to, to kill those projects because I've discovered that, you know, it's amazing how many times you, you kill something. And then a few years later, you, if you'd stayed with it, it would have been really successful. You just needed more time, you know? So, so we stay with them a long time, but sometimes we do stop them and we put them on the shelf and we say that it was a cool product, but it's not the right time. Or we, or we say, you know what, we're the wrong company to do that. We're not doing it. And then there's a team that's mm -hmm. incredibly disappointed. They've put their heart and soul into it. Sometimes it's one person, sometimes it's 20. And so 
with those people, we get, we, you know, we give every one of them a bonus. Uh, we can gra- we thank them for all the hard work. We congratulate them. And then we move them on to new projects. And the reason we do that is because they didn't fail. Mm. And, uh, and I don't want people afraid mm. to go on to these projects. Oh man, if it doesn't work, you, you get fired or, or you're a loser, <laughs> you know, no, you're a learner. One of my one of my most Fred one of my most successful general managers is a guy who's done about three or four. Don't tell anybody this. This guy who's done three or four seeds, and and I would say none of them have really hit it out of the park yet. Now he's in a big job. He's got multiple categories, and he's crushing it, absolutely crushing it. You know, so he's been learning. Mm, 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 mm. That's that's great. Yeah, it's, you make such a good point that if. No one would ever want to take on those. Risky project. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah, and I was just saying that if, if, if you punish people for, you know, failing on those projects, then no one would actually ever try to, to, to innovate and take on those exciting new challenges. Uh, I, you know, you know yeah. it goes back to that now, thing. Imagine, if, imagine, Fred, if, if you're to, if you're a six month old son, if every time they tried to stand up and they fell down, you scolded them, how long would it take them to walk? <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Yeah. We need to create that. Actually, we need to reward and incentivize, uh, you know, trial yeah. and error. Um, right. Now, Bracken, I didn't know that you were a poet, but I recently discovered that you had written a poem called The Secret to Success. Avoid it. Um, you know, you share an unconventional perspective about success. Let's look at the last paragraph, which says, remember success is the wolf in your tail. Live uh, early in life, live early in life, and always learn and please. Um, so can you talk about, um, you know, when you realize that success was the wolf in your tail? It's uh, a good question. I probably, um, you know, I grew up, as I said, I grew up with very little. So, you know, I, was, I always thought I wanted success. And I looked at people who had money. You know, I kind of like the, the, the person looking in the window at all the people, you know, living the good life. And I was never money oriented, but I thought, wow, they have such advantages that I don't have, you know. And, uh, and then when I went to college and university, you know, I was like, man, I, I, w- I was afraid to go to, yeah, I was afraid to even apply to one of the big universities in the U S because I knew they had fraternities and sororities. And I thought you had to have money to, to be a leader in fraternities and sororities. I want to go somewhere where I can be a leader and I get a fair shot, you know? So, so I didn't go to one of those. And then, and, you know, I had to hustle all my life, you know, in the early days, especially my brothers and sisters did too. And, and by the way, we were, we were, we were not as bad off as so many people. So I'm not pretending that, that we were the poorest people in town at all, but we we certainly didn't. We, we were a little. We were more hungry than the, the vast majority of the people I went to school with. And I I think it was probably in my thirties that I used to I used to regret that and think God, it's so you know, I, I used to feel sorry for myself, you know. And then finally, I think I was in my thirties and I thought it, it just hit me one time. Wow, you know what? The best thing that ever happened to me was growing up hungry. You know, I wish I could do that for my kids. You know, because I'm so lucky that I grew up with a single mother. I'm so lucky that I sat at that dining room table with, with three siblings who were hungry like me. And I'm so lucky. Now, if you grow up with without being the, the, the advantage, and sometimes it's not an advantage, it often doesn't feel like an advantage of having to hustle. If you grow up without that, you can still create it. It's never too late. And the magic there is called mm-hmm. goals. But, uh, mm-hmm. but you, know, I, you know, success is always to be afraid of, you know, and the minute you feel like you kind of made it, uh, you need to recheck who you are because you haven't made anything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're starting over again. The last question I'm going to ask. Yeah. Yeah. Never, always try and uh, get the success you've had and, and, over and, and look, look ahead and don't get caught up in, in, in that hype. So I'm going to ask you one last question. Then we're going to go to the audience. So audience, please, uh, you know, put start putting your questions in, in, in the in the in the chat. And Bracken, you said that finding your purpose is like driving a car, your destination. 
So how would you define your purpose and what destination are you personally heading towards? I started writing down my purpose back when I was in my thirties, I think maybe even in my twenties. Um, and I, I would say, and I don't remember exactly how I would articulate it, but something like this, I want to help uh, and make the world a better place. And I want to help pe other people, you know, use their, their uh, abilities to make the world a better place. And I think it's still that I don't think it's ever changed. And uh, I, uh, I probably put more value now in helping other people, help the world be a better place than myself now, because I realize how much it's, first of all, it's really rewarding. And secondly, I, I really think uh, I can be more effective doing that. Now that said, I will say, make one last uh, kind of comment, which, which is not controversial. It's a fact. Um, I'm not very good as a coach and I'm not very good as a manager, despite the fact that I run a public company and I've done very well and the company's done very well. It's not because I'm a good coach or manager, believe me. It's mostly because I really do a good job of staying out of great people's way. I just get involved where I think I need to. And even then I probably shouldn't sometimes. And sometimes I should get involved where I don't. But, um, but I would say that, you know, for me, my purpose really to help other people fulfill their, their purpose. Mm, mm, mm. I love that. Um, okay. So we're going to go to uh, some uh, questions from the audience now. Great. All right. So the first question is coming coming from Joy Atieno from Nairobi, Kenya. So Joy, why don't you come up and ask Bracken your question? Hello, everybody. Can you see me? Yes, we can. Hello, Joy. Hi, my name is Joy Atieno. I'm so happy to be on the same panel with Fred and Brack. Uh, yesterday, I just did my orientation into the room. And today, the first opportunity opens up. So, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, to my question. Uh, first one, uh, as a young professional, I always find it that, you know, even when I go for interviews, the question is like, you know, uh, when did you meet a challenging situation? How did you conquer it? It's just about like, tell us your success, your success, your success. So most of the time I end up like blowing my trumpet all the time and I'm not given any room to like uh, embrace my flaws and talk about my failures. So we are really, you know, uh, encouraging young professionals to just glorify the part of their success. So how can we help young professionals? Yes, I know I'm growing, I'm not yet there. Uh, I need to have milestones and all that. But then how can I also embrace, uh, you know, how can I be encouraged to embrace my failures and not be afraid to go to interviews and, you know, talk about them? Uh, the second one is um, when you're at a leadership role, uh, you know, I always say it's not bragging if it's based on facts. If I really did that and I achieved, then why should I not say it? It's also the aspect of self-defeating humor. How do I, you know, embrace the human side of me? People who work under me should not feel like, like I'm a, I'm a perfect human being. So it is in those two aspects. Number one, as a young professional, how can we encourage young professionals that are just growing and coming up to embrace their flaws as much as they are forced to speak and blow their, their trumpet about their successes? And as a leader, how do I, I inspire a team to think that, you know, I'm just like them. I make mistakes without losing, you know, your authority. So thank you so much. Those are great questions. And I'd say the first one, how can we do it? I think you're right that uh, probably the interviewing process is, is, is really difficult. You know, I, I don't like interviews. I don't like either side of interviews. They're really hard. I, I'm probably better interviewing now than I've ever been, uh, but I'm still not very good at it. I, I do really respect people in interviews when, uh, let me give you a tip, okay, for, for future interviews for yourself. What I used to do is uh, I would take all the questions that I could think of somebody might ask me in an interview, and then across the top of the page, I would have different places I was, and you know, maybe it was different jobs or, or maybe something, I uh, a time in school, time growing up, first job, second job. And then I would say, okay, the first one, you know, give me an example of a difficult situation you faced and how you dealt with it. And then I would write 
in that block. So I'd have this, this little, these blocks and I'd write in that block, okay, here's one that, that, were, that was like that in school. Now in those blocks, I would fill in stuff and, and some of the examples would be successful examples and some of them wouldn't be, you know? And so I was, I, I, I put them both in there. And then, and then in interviews, I would, I would share, I would be sure I had one or two that was, that were perceived as successful because that's, you're right. Unfortunately, that's the way interviews work. But then I, sometimes I was, I would explain where, where I failed and what I learned from it. And I tell you, I think I was more effective when I had that combination of successes and failures in my interviews than I was when I only talked about the things where I was successful. You know, I, one of those criticisms I hear of people when they interview other people is they'll say, you know, oh, I asked somebody what their, their weakness was. And they said, well, I'm, I, I care too much about my work. <laughs> you know, the, the, the false weakness, you know. And I think, um, I think people respect you in most interviews. If you have a combination of, you know, here are the things I did that were successful. Here are the things that didn't work. But here's what I learned from it. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. We have a question yeah, from, um, okay. sorry. Were you going to respond no, to the ahead, second question, Barry? Yeah, I can, I can respond to that one very quickly. I think yeah. authenticity is, is golden. And I think the longer we live, the more we realize, the, the lo as time progresses, people respect authenticity even more. So I think being, you know, if, as a leader, being honest about the things you're doing that, that didn't work, and even being honest about your weaknesses in front of your team is a good idea, period. Mm -hmm. And you respect and people will see that you're, re you're a real human being as, and you have the vulnerability yep. to lend you closer to your people. Um, there's a question exactly. from Benson Magura on, on who's joining us on YouTube, and he says, in terms of lateral learning, when is it ever enough? When can one decide that they've learned enough and that they, they now can go out and be creative and make something happen with that knowledge? Uh, I think the answer is never. You know, you, you're never, you've never learned enough. Uh, on the other hand, you've always, you always know enough to be creative with the knowledge you have. So there's nothing stopping you from using what you have. You're just a constant construction project and that project's never finished. So you keep, and you keep fueling yourself with new stuff all the time. Okay, okay. Um, our next question is from Karen Peterson. She's joining us from Johannesburg, uh, South Africa. Karen, can you come up and ask your question, please? Sorry about that. Hi, Bracken. Nope. Great Hi, conversation. Um, my question is, um, what book has had the greatest impact on your life and how has it shaped your thinking? I would say probably uh, I'll I'll cheat and give two. I'm thinking of a third one, so I'll stop myself. <laughs> I would say uh, Mark Aurelius's Meditations, okay, which is an old book and it's kind of short and it's kind of boring after a little bit, but it's just so astonishing to me that somebody could write something so full of wisdom at the age when he did. I think he was in his late 20s. Um, the second one that's, that's had a big impact on me the last decade is a book called Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, you, you might know it, it by Daniel Kahneman. And uh, it's also, uh, please don't quote me on this, I, I, Daniel Kahneman's brilliant, but there's a, the first eight chapters are, are kind of fun to read. I think I've read those first eight chapters a few times, but it just it helps you understand how much bias you have, you know, and, and you really have to work your way out of it. If I could add a third one, there's a book called Biased in the U.S., which is uh, is a phenomenal book. But but I'll I'll stop at the two. <laughs> Fantastic, thanks. Great, yeah. thanks, Karen. Uh, there's a question from YouTube from Barbara Kuam who says, "Watching from Houston, Texas, how did you manage to implement the change in design mindset throughout your company?" Uh, first, it took a while. You know, I think when people look at us now and say, wow, you, you're this, you know, you, you and, and Alistair, who's my head of design, you're, you're a real turnaround experts. And I always, I want to laugh when I hear that because it took so long to get design all the way through to the point where we are now. Um, so it started with um, caring about design. You know, I personally started trying to learn about design years and years ago. I mean, I was reading about design. I was watching videos of people, great designers. I, I, I really tried to understand great design principles. 
And then I, when I came to Logitech, I, I got deeply involved in the product and I, I would try to be a designer, you know, even though I'm not. And, uh, and, I, and then, I, then I hired the head of design. It was a former head of design for Nokia. And he and I just sat down and we, drove, we wrote down some design principles and we kind of argued about them and we got to five that we really believed in. And then we started hiring people. And, uh, and then we started bringing in designers and, and then we started caring about awards. because we thought You talked about humility, but the truth is, in a way, your approach is very narcissistic as well. In other words, we're just this, that company you talked that about just humility, helps other people and but, serves, uh, devotes ourselves to the service of others. But in fact, that's really a rather narcissistic point of view. The idea that you can show, you know, people how to make an Apple product better and that you can show how to make a Microsoft product better or a PlayStation work better or whatever is the experience, that you have the capability of, of approaching these huge products and these hugely successful companies and saying, okay, you know, your interface is fine, but we actually have a better version of it. And the presumptuousness, the presumptuousness with which you both approach that product idea and also the success that you've had doing it in a way that's a very narcissistic uh, approach, but yet you do it in such with such a self-effacing, uh, you know, sense of humility. Um, I think that's what inspires people. You, you know what, Ken? I think it's a very fair way to, to describe it. I think the, the the reality is, I think there are an, in, there are seven billion people who could do this. Maybe not exactly what we're doing, but can make almost everything around them better. There's nothing I look at in my life and probably nothing you look at in your life that's good enough. And, uh, and or, or that with a little imagination and or a lot of imagination and a, and a partnership or two or a lot of partnerships, you couldn't make, you can bring more to. And that's what makes life so amazing. I mean, nature is the most uh, powerful innovator I know of. And we're part of nature, you know, and if we work individually or collectively, we can do almost anything. We can keep evolving things forward in marginally in marginal gains or sometimes in bold moves. Thank, thank you. I, I, I think it is, this has been such an inspirational talk, especially the part where you explained how you inspire your people to have no regrets about the past and no fear of the future. I thought that was just um, uh, extraordinary because so, so few people are, are, you know, ever think to approach their life that way. I think they, they spend most of their life dwelling on their regrets and fearing their uh, abilities. Isn't that, isn't that sad? You know, I just, I just have to stop and, and comment on that because you're so articulate, Ken. You said everything I, I said in, in four words. I, it's so sad to think about that, the, that so many people live a life afraid, uh, afraid to fail, meaning, meaning limiting their own future, and then regretting the past, meaning spending the present thought thinking about something they can't affect. Instead of looking back in the past just to learn and then living fearlessly into the future. You know, it's, it's the opposite. And yet it, it's amazing how binary it is that, and we all do it to some extent, but it's amazing how binary it is. Lots to think about there. Thank you. Um, uh, I have, we have this um, segment, um, which we call the firewall bracken, where we're going to ask you, um, a couple of questions and you've got less than seven words to answer them in. <laughs> okay. I like that. So you ready? I'm re I think, I hope I'm ready. <laughs> what is your favorite Logitech product and why? Mm. Oh no, is he frozen again? Oh, I'm not frozen. I'm thinking, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> this is like asking me what which is my favorite child. You know, it's just terrible. Um, I will say it's Streamlabs. And I, I hope why? I have seven words to answer why. It's Streamlabs because it's somebody, it's something that was created outside of here that we brought in that is very innovative. It has its own trees, plants, and seeds, operates like a microcosm of Logitech, is completely a service. There's no hardware involved at all. And, uh, and the people feel so free to create. 
And I love the fact that they're new to the company. So that's my favorite for now. Okay. Which design principle is most important? Idea, soul, effortless, or magical? Why? Magical. Um, the magical part is the thing that you bring that makes the experience very special to the user. The rest are ways to find your way to make that product, uh, to get the product in a place that's meaningful and memorable. But the magical part is what the person experiences. What is the strangest thing you've ever eaten? Scorpions. Scorpions? <laughs> Fried scorpions. They taste like potato chips. What is the worst place uh, you could ever get stuck? In a line. I hate waiting. What is one thing you own you wish you didn't? Everything. Because I don't really own anything. Because none of us do. We're just borrowing it. It's the planet Earth's. Complete the sentence. Impact means? Changed my life. What is one thing you tried that you knew would be really bad at, but did it anyway? I just, you know, the problem is that the, the really bad at because I don't really, as you know, with my view of failure, I don't really care if I'm bad at something. So I don't, there's nothing I think I'd be really bad at because I don't care if it, I'm not good at it. So it's really hard for me to answer that. I've tried many things I'm not good at. I mean, uh -oh. Sorry, we need to mute in the background, please. Okay. Um, Complete the sentence. My children have taught me. A lot more than I've taught them. What fortune would you want to get from a fortune cookie? You'll have a lot of chances. Thank you so much. Uh, we've run obviously a bit over time due to um, our technical breakdown, but it's been such an honor listening to you and you sharing with us so much to walk away from, to walk away with um, on behalf of the room and all the members here today. Um, we really appreciate your time. Well, it's been such an honor to be here. Please tell Fred that, thank Fred, and thank you, Naima and Ken and, uh, and everyone in the room. What you guys are doing is so special and amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm super impressed. And uh, you know, if I can help you in any way in the future, if I can help anybody on this, anybody who's listening in the future, feel, feel free to reach out to me through LinkedIn and I'll do whatever I can to help you. Pathway with Fred Swanica. Be sure to tune in next time and stay engaged with our other social media channels. For members joining us on Zoom, stay on the call as we continue the conversation.